Okay, Amit, you can start. Okay, please, can you see my, my screen? Yeah, I can see. Uh, can okay. you uh, turn on the camera? Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Abdullah Muhammad. I would like to appreciate you all for the opportunity given to me to present our work, which we can easily see from the title that in this particular work, we are actually concerned with the problem of finding an element in a non-empty intersection of the solution sets of three different important problems. The first problem, the first problem is, is a problem of finding a point in the domain of a map T, satisfying the condition given in the sets F of T, known as a fixed point problem, which is very important problem since various uh, problems in real world applications can be expressed as a fixed point problem. Next, we consider the notion of asymptotic fixed points of operator, which is defined as a fixed point uh, of, a, of an operator T, if there exists an approximate fixed point sequence in the space converging weakly to that particular point. We can see from this inclusion uh, relation that the set of asymptotic fixed points of any operator is a subset of the set of fixed points. Uh, basically, whenever we talk about fixed points, uh, one is actually expected to hold the, the natural question is uh, fixed point of what? So in this regard, we are referring to the fixed point of a nonlinear operator for which the fixed point is to be approximated, which are of different classification. So here we start with a class of a Lipschitz continuous mapping defined by or described in the inequality one with a non-negative constant real number k satisfying the inequality one. Uh, we can see from here that this is generalized class of nonlinear mapping since we can uh, reduce to various uh, classes of nonlinear operators as special cases of this one. For example, if the constant k is in the interval 0, 1, then uh, the inequality 1 reduced to what you call uh, uh, t become a contraction mapping, which is also a very important operator, more especially in the setting of uh, for the engineering applications, where most of their problems of partial and ordinary differential equation problems can be formulated and solved as a fixed point problem of contraction mapping. You can also see here that in particular, if the constant k is equal to one, we have what you call a non-expansive mapping. Another problem of interest in this work is a zero problem, which is defined as a problem of a zero of inverse strongly monotone mapping defined in three. If there exists a, stri a strictly positive real number tau satisfying the condition uh, three. A zero of an operator B is a point in the states B inverse of zero satisfying this particular uh, condition. In 2003, uh, Fung and, his, uh, and Hong introduced the generalized notion of monotonicity of an operator B uh, defined as a relaxed eta alpha monotone mapping satisfying the inequality, inequality four, where eta is a bimapping and alpha is a function. So since its introduction, uh, many mathematicians developed and studied various problems involving this particular uh, generalized operator. Uh, for example, in 2014, Cheng and his associates uh, studied the following generalized mixed equilibrium problem uh, involving eta alpha monotone mapping which we can see from here that uh, considering the, the inequality, the, the, the generalized mixed equilibrium problem five, one can easily deduce most of the, uh, the, uh, most of the class classifications of uh, uh, equilibrium problem as special cases of this one. For example, uh, if 
eta is, uh, if B is monotone, then we have what we call generalized mixed equilibrium problem without uh, relaxed eta alpha monotone matrix and so on. So for more details on uh, equilibrium problems, one is suggested to consult uh, the references three and four. In order to find or to solve the problem five, that is the generalized uh, mixed equilibrium problem involving uh, relaxed eta alpha monotone mapping, uh, the following assumptions are made on the by function B, on by, the, by function by five. The first assumption is F1, F2, F3, F2, F4. So very recently, Chan et al. proposed the following uh, iterative algorithm for approximating the fixed point of non-expansive mapping in the framework of Hilbert space. Now uh, we can see that this iterative algorithm is developed by combining uh, the classical man iterative algorithm with uh, shrinking, hybrid shrinking projection methods of Takahashi and Takahashi and uh, the inertial uh, term proposed by Poliak in 1964 as an acceleration process that is accelerated uh, acceleration process of as a process of fastening the sequence of iterates toward the solution. He also combine it with uh, what you call uh, a conjugate gradient direction, which is also known to be a accelerated version of uh, classical gradient methods. So based on what we have discovered in this particular iterative method, we developed uh, the following uh, interesting questions. The first question is, in their result, they were able to establish the weak, uh, the strong convergence when they imposed the boundedness condition on, on C, because we can see from here that they require the value M, which is the diameter of, of C. So for this diameter to exist, the C must be uh, bounded. So the first question here is, we try to see if we can dispense that strong assumption of boundedness on C. And secondly, we tried uh, to extend the result from the setting of Hilbert space to the setting of more general Banach space. And thirdly, we tried to generalize the result from non-expansive mapping to a countable family of uh, relatively non-expansive uh, markers. Both, we tried to see if we can develop an algorithm for finding a common solution of three different uh, problems instead of that is in addition to the fixed point problem considered by Chan et al. <clears throat> so in order to uh, 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 attempt the aforementioned questions uh, uh, affirmatively, the following uh, definitions and lemmas <clears throat> are very are quite relevant. <clears throat> the first definition is, is on the uh, set valued map called normalized duality mapping, which is used when working in the framework of a Banach space more general than Hilbert space because of the absence of uh, uh, various identities, including the inner, the, the inner product. So this is used as an analog to the inner product, which provides us, which provides us with a pairing between a Banach space and its dual space. The second definition is Lyapunov functional, which is a generalization of a distance function. That is, instead of using uh, the normed distance considered in their work, we try to see if we can establish our result using a more general distance function of Lyapunov. Another definition is generalized projection, which is also a generalization of the classical metric projection in the setting of Hilbert space. So based on these uh, definitions, we can define the relatively non-expansive mapping as follows. If the set of asymptotic non-expansive of T and the set of fixed point of T are equivalent and are assumed to be non-empty, then the inequality 20 uh, hold. The following lemma is also used because we are trying to uh, consider the countable family of uh, tau inverse strongly monotone mappings. So this lemma is established in the in the in, in paper four for countable family of uh, inverse strongly monotone mapping. The following lemma is also used in establishing our results because we are considering the countable family of relatively non-expansive mapping. So if we have Ti as a countable family of this uh, relatively non-expansive mapping, 
And suppose that delta i and mu i are sequences in zero one satisfy this condition. And if we define T of X as this, then it has been proved in paper two that T X is also a relatively non-expansive mapping. And the set of fixed points of T X is equals to the set is equals to the intersection of the set of fixed points of T i's. The following lemma is also used, which provides us with the proximal operator of the uh, equilibrium problem with the following assumptions and the following if the if the above assumptions hold then the following are satisfied <clears throat> so for the main result we actually start with the following uh, lemma if in what follows b stand for the uh, uh, Tau inverse strongly monotone mapping. A is eta hemicontinuous, uh, eta relaxed, relaxed eta alpha monotone mapping. Pi is a bifunction, which as which is assumed to satisfy the conditions F1 and F2. Pi is a proper convex and lower semi-continuous function. T is a mapping described in 10, that is T is a relatively non-expensive mapping. And we assume that the intersection of the, of the set of the solutions is non-empty. Uh, is, is denoted by omega, then if we assume that the omega is non-empty, then with the conditions I1 to, to, to 4 to 5 and uh, a condition 6, then the sequence generated by this algorithm converges strongly uh, to, to an element in the omega, <clears throat> provided that the following conditions hold. These are the uh, conditions. We assume that beta n is converging to zero and the inf of this is bigger than zero and this is bounded. So based on the result established from that particular lemma, we developed our main convergence theorem here. In what follows delta i, beta b i, tau i are sequences in this interval uh -huh. with this assumption, b i, is a countable family of mappings defined in three, that is bi is tau i inverse strongly monotone mappings. A is eta hemicontinuous mapping, satisfying condition four. Pi is a bifunction, which is assumed to satisfy conditions F1 to F4, up to this one. Omega is also assumed to be the intersection of the solution sets. Then if X is too real uniformly convex and uniformly smooth bionic space, which is dual space X star, and B I, A I, up to T I are stated above, and so that the intersection, the intersections of the solutions is non-empty, and assume that the conditions I1 to five of lemma seven and the following addition, additional conditions are satisfied, then we proved that the sequence Xn generated by algorithm 12 converges strongly to a point in omega. That is in the common, in the in X, we converge strongly to a common uh, solution of the three uh, problems, provided that the conditions D1 and D3 hold. So for the numerical examples, uh, we actually start considering the numerical examples because we are trying to see if we can compare our results uh, with some existing results in the literature. So we are not done with the numerical result. That is why we cannot actually uh, present the numerical result here because we don't know what will happen in the future. Our expectation is just to have uh, 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 strong, uh, is, is to have uh, significantly, significant, uh, <clears throat> is to have a high performance iterative convergence when compared with some existing results in the literature. And, Conclusively, in this particular uh, result, as we can see, we consider the conjugate gradient direction in the setting of uh, uniformly convex and uniformly smooth bionic space using the Lyapunov functional. And to best of our knowledge, this is the first time uh, in which the conjugate direction is applied when the Lyapunov functional is, 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 is used as a metric distance. Here are the references. Thank you for your attention.
Masiro, you have question, right? You open your microphone. Okay. Thank you for the night nice talk. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. I really appreciate it. Jamil, you have a question? No, oh, Jamil to have a question, not Jamil one. Yeah, Jamil one. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Abdullahab, for this nice presentation. Uh, my question is with regard to the initial uh, algorithms that was introduced by Poliak in 1964. I just want to know uh, the implication of using inertial. Uh, whenever we use inertial on in a particular algorithm, does that mean that uh, that particular inertial will speed up the algorithm, the performance of the algorithm automatically, even without testing the uh, the numerical performance? Uh, this is actually very uh, important question. Uh, basically, uh, there is no any uh, general uh, theoretical facts uh, stating that whenever we incorporate the inertial uh, term into our algorithms, uh, the, the, the convergence rate will, will significantly be improved. It depends on the specific example you consider and the nature of the uh, iterative methods. Uh, in most cases, more especially in the setting of uh, hybrid shrinking projection methods, it has been proved and justified by uh, many scholars, many mathematicians, that the shrinking property of the half space, uh, the shrinking properties of the half space will actually affect the performance of the, uh, the, the, the implicate the effects of the inertia when it is incorporated. Uh, with the iterative algorithm, it mostly uh, uh, its effect can mostly be detected when the iterative algorithm is not uh, shrinking projection time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's nice. Thank you very much for this uh, wonderful answer. Thank you. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I cannot hear you. Let me continue. Enter this. Is it the function of the operator that is semi continuous? Semi continuous is a function because you can see we are defining F. F is said to be uh, beta is said to be semi continuous if we can find if we can have a function f defined from this interval to to r. This is r. So we can see that that semi continuous function is uh, it's actually a function. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Any question? Okay. Thank you again, uh, Mr. Amit. Okay, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the night question. Uh, we move to the next presenter, Mr. Nasilo. If you're ready, you can. Share your screen and let's start. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. 
then onion okay. and uh, my name is uh, Nasir Usaliu. I'm here to present the topics on hybrid conjugate gradient methods with restart strategy for Riemannian optimization. In continuation of the fixed point lab seminar series, under the advisorship of my professor, able professor Pum Kampu. These are the outline of uh, my presentation. We are going to look at some preliminaries motivation on this talk. We talk about uh, manifold optimization, the scope of the study, aims and objective methodology, as well as uh, numerical result and conclusion. As we all know, in any given optimization problems, we first of all need to identify some objectives that depends on certain variables. These set variables may be restricted or not. And if the variables are restricted, we have constraint optimization problem. Our aim is to find the value of the objectives. So solving this problem sometimes may be a big tax. As a result of uh, some optimization problems cannot be solved analytically or graphically because, in, because of the nature of their problem. So in this case, we normally use optimization algorithm in order to find the approximate solution of the given problem. Now consider the problem minimize f of x subject to x belongs to Rn. This is an unconstrained optimization problem in Euclidean spaces, where the assumption is that f is smooth. If f is smooth and differentiable, we have uh, algorithms like uh, gradient algorithm, like steeper descent method, conjugate gradient method, in order to find the minimizer of the problem. Now, these type of problems are normally, normally come up in various uh, fields like in sciences, engineering, economics, and industry. Take for instance, if you have inverse problems, which normally come up in uh, signal processing problems and now uh, image processing problems. It also come up in time varying optimization problems involving arm robotic uh, problem. We also have this form of problem in identifying seismic properties. And in designing portfolio of an investment, we also have such type of problem. So our aim target in solving this problem naturally is to find extra, that is the minimizer, such as this property holds, meaning that the function value at the current iterate is less than or equals to the function value at the previous iterate. The extra that fulfill this condition is normally called stationary point. And if the gradient of the function vanishes at this point, then we have the minimizer of the given problem. Normally, we normally start with some X naught, that is an initial point, in order to gaze for the minimizer using the iterative scheme given by this, where the DK here and uh, alpha K here characterizes the algorithm that is differentiate one algorithm from the other. We the, the alpha k is normally called step length. It is a scalar that determines how long we are going to stay on the search for the minimizer on the direction dk. Now, if you consider this problem, that is, we consider finding x in Rn that minimizes this given function subject to some constraint x transports x is equals to one. If we now consider this problem as an unconstrained optimization problem without the constraint, then we are going to solve the problem by moving in the direction that is uh, negative to the gradient, meaning the direction that uh, the steepest downhill direction. So as such now, the problem is now terms as a line search algorithm. However, if we consider the problem as constraint optimization problem. Normally, we normally introduce Langrand multiplier in order as, a, as an additional term associated with the constraint in order to solve the problem. So if we view this problem as constraint optimization problem, then moving in the direction of negative gradient, then the constraint is no longer satisfied, which means the search direction or the grad f of x has no information on the constraint. So based on that, we can now seek the solution of the given problem in the set of 
point that fulfill this condition. So if we do that, we now view the optimization problem in Euclidean optimization as a Riemannian optimization problem. That is to say, we are solving constraint optimization as an unconstrained optimization in Riemannian manifold. So this is one of our basic motivation of the given talk in this afternoon. Now, since grad of f of x has no relationship with z, with the sphere, if you, are, if you are talking about scape sphere, then the next thing to do is to project the grad of x to, this, to the tangent plane. In this case, you can see that the such direction is outside the tangent plane. That is why we are using the projection. Assuming this direction is within the tangent plane, which is the reflection on this uh, sphere, we can actually use what we call retraction, which we are going to discuss later in the course of this presentation. Now, in general, this optimization problem, which is an which is constrained optimization in Euclidean optimization, can be viewed as an unconstrained optimization problem given by this problem here. Now, our main target is to solve a smooth manifold. That is, our search space is on a smooth manifold. When we say smooth manifold, we mean a differentiable curvy hypersurface, which the mathematical definition relies on the concept of topological space, charts, and homeomorphisms, which we are going to look at in the course of this presentation. And we also need the function to be smooth as well. So based on that, our main target here too is to find the minimizer. Here, the minimizer is not on Euclidean spaces, but rather on the manifold M, which is uh, smooth. It's in which is in order to optimize a given objective, we need the, 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 the function we are optimizing requires to fulfill this condition. Whereby uh, some other multi motivation of this problem is regard as regard to the solution of some manifolds like a stiffest manifold, which normally come up in so many agent value problems that normally come up in machine learning, principal component analysis, and theoretical physics. So the actual uh, interpretation of the given problem is that uh, we want the mass rate to be orthogonal and its columns to be autonomous. So based on that, we can now represent the matrix as a stiffest manifold. That is a uh, optimization problem on matrix manifold. And other special, um, special stiffest manifold is called spatial orthogonal group, which normally used in robotic uh, control problems and many other problems. Uh, given a nice manifold together with uh, X, that is with X on this manifold, the point X on the manifold, in order to move around the manifolds, we require some basic tools. Part of this basic essential tool is what we call tangent space. The tangent space at X, which is TXM with elements psi and eta is given by this. What we are saying is that given a manifold M at point X, we take a direction whether we take a direction, different direction at these points. So if we move in these directions, we are definitely leaving the manifold. So, an important aspect of the tangent space is that if you zoom the manifold closely, the tangent, the, the space now will look like Euclidean space, which will enable us to uh, do so many things. Now, the general iterative schemes in classical optimization problems is given by this, whereby this is uh, a linear in nature. We have a scalar multiplication and we have addition as well as a subtraction. So this form of schemes is normally uh, iterative scheme for space descent and some conjugate gradient algorithm. And uh, these schemes, the iterative schemes here is for Newton method. The major challenge in uh, uh, Riemannian or manifold optimization is the issue of linearity, whereby we cannot take clearly have addition as well as scalar product, uh, product. And this direction is not on the manifold radar, it is on the tangent space. So based on that, we need a replica of these tools. 
part of the replica of the tools we are going to use in order to make generalization from Euclidean optimization to Riemannian optimization is what we call retraction. Retraction is actually, you have a point on the manifold X and you take a direction uh, eta, which is not on the manifold. As soon as you leave the manifold, in order to get the next points, you need to retract. That is, you need to take the point back to the manifold. So we take the point back to the manifold using what we call uh, retraction, which it requires to require these uh, conditions mathematically. Another important property that will help us do this is what we call vector transpose. As soon as we retract the point back to the manifold, if you observe, this point on the manifold, Rx of psi of x, is no longer in the same tangent space Txm. So therefore, we need to transport the point. This we need to in, we need a concept that will enable us the point that will enable the point on the manifold to interact with each other. Since the conjugate gradient directions uh, take note of the or a previous direction in order to update a given points on the manifold. So based on that, we need to transport the point. We need to transport one point to the other on the manifold. And we use what the notion of vector transport in order to do that. And this is mathematically required to fulfill this condition. The structure of algorithms on manifold optimization is normally you have a point X n on the manifold, you take a direction which is on the tangent space, not on the manifold, and uh, you use the iterate this in order to update the uh, points on the manifold until the required result that is the minimizer is achieved. This is the representation of this explanation, whereby you have X node, you take a direction psi node, which is not on the manifold, then you take it back to the manifold. The next thing is the X one, which is another point, you continue doing that until the required result uh, is uh, obtained. In order, generally, in order to make this uh, extension from Euclidean optimization to remain in a manifold, we require some basic definition, which, which include inner product. This inner product is not a, uh, the inner product is given by this, whereby it is unique as far as uh, the, structure of manifold is concerned. Another important concept is that, uh, as we said earlier, that uh, smooth manifold requires the no notion of topology and topological spaces. If you have a set X, the topology on X is a collection tau of the subset satisfying these uh, properties, meaning that uh, the smallest set and the larger set is in the set. The finite uh, intersection of the uh, open set is also in the set. So also arbitrary union of the open set are also open. So the set X and tau, the pair of X and tau that fulfill this condition is called topological space. Another important concept we require is what we call house door space. House door space, if you have two points X1 and X2, there is some open set U and V such that if you pick point X1 in U and X2 in V, the intersection of this point is empty. Then we have what we call house door space. So also we, we require the concept of a topological manifold. A topological manifold, XT is called, a top, uh, this topology is called a topological manifold if it has following, con satisfy following condition. That is first, the topology is housed off, it has countable basis and it is locally homomorphic to d-dimensional equilibrium space. This is one of the important property that we, we normally use in order to move around the manifold. Then from here now, we cannot define Riemannian manifold, but uh, in defining Riemannian manifold, that is smooth manifold, we require the concept of our atlas as well as charts and uh, maximum atlas in order to do that. So based on that, we can now define our Riemannian manifold, which is a differentiable manifold endowed with the Riemannian matrix called Riemannian manifold. With the Riemannian mat matrix now, we can now talk about distance angles on the manifold and many other things will now follow. So based on that, the gradients as regard to the tangent space is now given by this. So also 
the formal definition of uh, retraction is now given by this, which is a mapping from the tangent space to the manifold that fulfill this condition, while the vector transpose is a mapping from what? From tangent bundle to the tangent uh, to the manifold or to the tangent space, which also require to fulfill the following conditions, linearity and what, and what have you. Now, given a manifold M, given a function M, we take a, a point that is from M to R, we need to find the minimizer using this. So the iterative scheme in Euclidean space based on the definition of um, retraction and vector transpose can be now be given by this, which was first introduced by Smith in 1994, as well as Abbasil, Mahoney, and Sepulchuri in 20, 2008. So the next thing is for us to have a replica of the line search representation in Euclidean space to remain an optimization. These two inequalities we have is one of the important line search, line search techniques in Euclidean space is called standard wolf line search, which is represented into the Riemannian setting using definition nine and 10, that is the relation of retraction as well as um, inner products, which is given by this, whereby sometimes the convergence analysis of a given problem may require other techniques, other wolf line set techniques, rather than standard wolf line set, line set techniques, which is called strong wolf line, given by these and the two equalities inequality switch, we represent them in Riemannian manifold as this. This representation was actually given by Ring and Weave in 2012 in uh, an attempt to solve or extend a first classical Euclidean country gradient from Euclidean setting to Riemannian manifold. So also they extended the classical search direction to Riemannian search direction, which is given by this using the notion of vector transpose. These are some uh, classical Euclidean CD parameters. Normally, these three parameters are considered to be one of the best CD parameters numerically because they have uh, a research future in which if the algorithm is not actually uh, interesting, that is uh, the performance is no more interesting. They cannot restart themselves in, in order to avoid taking short steps. So the second group of the Euclidean uh, CG parameters are normally characterized by the good convergence property, but their numerical performance is actually not that good. So using the notion of uh, vector transpose as well as um, retraction, we can now generalize these parameters to uh, Riemannian CD parameters as follows, whereby FR is also generated as, of, as follows. The other three are also generated to Riemannian CD setup as that. The first, is, uh, the first generalization of CD from Euclidean CG to Riemannian was actually established by Rink and Wyeth in 2012, where they showed the convergence of a Riemannian Flitterif conjugate method using standard wolf line condition. Later on in 2013 and 2016, Sato showed the Riemannian Dai and Yuan generation and also show that uh, this parameter generate descent generation and converge globally using, uh, this one is using strong wolf line search condition while this is using weak wolf line search condition. That is standard wolf line search condition. And this one is using strong wolf line search, search, line search condition. Later on, Sakai and Iduka also follow the same suit in order to show the convergence of PRP and s -health HS methods, whereby they know they show this, uh, they show the uh, convergence of these parameters as hybrid method given by hybrid one and hybrid two. Later on in 2023, Tank also followed the same suit in order to show the convergence of PRP and FR methods without line start consideration. Now, the scope of this work is that uh, we are restricted to solving some non-linear conjugate gradient problems with their generalization to Riemannian optimization. The aim, 
of this work is to improve some convergence structures. That is the aim is to analyze the, some classical CG parameters with the aim of improving their uh, convergence structures as well as uh, gen their generalization to Riemannian uh, CG setups. And also we are also aim at identifying some useful areas where these algorithms can be applied in a real world situation. Now, the take for instance, the beta K obtained by you and Wei in 2007, which is given by this generalization, whereby the motivation behind this is as a result of what we call restart strategy, whereby the actual motivation behind this formulation is that if the two consecutive gradients, the, we want to avoid a situation whereby the terms involved in the two consecutive gradients are not orthogonal to each other. So based on that, they come up with this research strategy in order to take note of that. Now, we feel that if we establish or extend this parameter to Riemannian optimization setup, we can actually improve the convergence and some structures of our Riemannian CD parameters. Based on that, if we now denote grad of f of s is equal to g of s, we can now generalize the beta k, beta k n mu into Riemannian setup as this, whereby based on this generalization, we have three important formulas. Which the first one is actually needed in showing the sufficient, sufficient descent of the given problem, while the other two are actually showing that the method reduced to Fletcher Reeves as well as it reduced to PRP method. Based on that reduction, we can now see that we can now show the convergence of PRP as well as uh, FR method using this uh, beta key. So based on that, we come up with two important hybrid parameters given by this parameter, HRCG1 and 2, which are defined as given there. So in order to show the sufficient descent of our beta K, beta K R mu, we need it to satisfy this condition. That is, we need the, we, we need the parameter to satisfy this uh, first definition of our beta k in Riemannian setting. Based on this inequality, we now show the sufficient descent condition of our method without line search generalization. This assumption that mu here is greater than one. So this is how it's shown. And in order to also show the convergence of some other beta case, you and we also define this uh, beta k which is given by this structure. And we also generalize this uh, beta K into Riemannian set of using definition nine and 10, that is definition of retraction as well as a vector transpose in order to extend this parameter into Riemannian CG. So also based on that, if we apply the definition of uh, sufficient descent here, we're actually going back to our first definition of the beta K up there. So that's other important properties like uh, sufficient descent as well as global convergence can easily follow without, without actually showing that of a beta, beta K R VLS. So based on this setup, we come up with this hybrid method. Actually, there is omission here. The hybrid method is supposed to be two like the, what we have in the first one. Okay, these are the hybrid methods. So based on that generalization above, we have these hybrid methods whereby we hybridize the beta k ls with beta k r ls and r c this is supposed to be r not n r c d so after showing the sufficient descent of the given problem the next thing is to show that the algorithm actually converges that is irrespective of our, our initial point we can actually show that the algorithm actually converges using this theorem nine here with the assumption. This assumption is actually Lipschitz representation of a Riemannian version, whereby this is the authentic version of a, a Riemannian theorem that is actually requiring line search in order to show the convergence of the given problem. 
So based on theorem nine and 10, we actually show the convergence of our algorithm based on this requirement. The first requirement is that uh, we assume the, that the norm of the vector transport does not actually exceed the norm of the third direction after the vector transport. And we also employ differentiated retraction as a vector transport in this work. We also need to show F to be bounded below. And uh, alpha K in some cases need to satisfy some wolf lines condition. In order to show the convergence of the algorithm, we need to show that DK is sufficient descent and also bounded below. Then the gradient is lifted continuous. So based on this, we establish the convergence of our algorithm. These are one of uh, the main theoretical contribution of our work to the literature of Riemannian optimization. First of all, using this inequality here, with this inequality here, which are be defined based on beta k r n mu, we can we are able to relax lemma 3.21 in 21, that is ring and width in 2012, where they show the convergence of FR method using strong wolf line search conditions. So based on this condition, we actually don't require line search in showing the convergence and in showing the sufficient distance any, anymore. So also we relax the theorem 3.1 of Sakai and Iduka of 2022, which with the theorem eight above there, whereby we show the sufficient descent of F PRP method without line start consideration. So also that happens to VLS as regard to beta K RLS, RLS and RCD, which are given in Sato and Sakai and Iduka. Sorry, which are given in Sato 2022. As for the algorithm, we use this algorithm in order to solve our some Riemannian optimization problems that actually we actually use them in order to show the robustness of our algorithm. So these are some of the algorithms we actually, which these are some of the problems we actually solve in order to show the robustness of our algorithm. The first one of them is relate quotient minimization problem or unit spire on unit space. And uh, we also have uh, low rank matrix approximation problem, robust matrix approximation problem. And we also have brocade cost function minimization on units um, on unit spin. So based on those problems, we are able to solve 270 problems with different parameters of the problem, whereby these are the graphs obtained after solving the problems, which we can easily see that our hybrid methods, which are given by HRCG1, HRCG2, HR VLS plus one, HR VLS plus two, which is uh, easily can be, we can easily obtain from these two graphs, which is based on number of uh, iteration and number of function evaluation. So based on these graphs, we can easily see that our two hybrid method, that is hybrid methods as regard VLS and hybrid method as regard VLS two, are able to solve all the test problem without failing. So also in the next two graphs, which is based on grad gradient evaluation, we can easily see that uh, the hybrid, two of our hybrid proposed methods here are able to solve the problems, all the two, all the given problem results failing. So also if we take a look of uh, the performance profile based on CPU time, we can also easily record that this shows that uh, the two hybrid CD parameters are actually uh, robust and efficient than the other methods we, know we actually considered in the numerical experimentation of uh, this given project, whereby we consider the classical FR, that is the um, Riemannian FR, Riemannian PRP, Riemannian LS, in this uh, uh, work. As for the conclusion of this uh, presentation, we are 
actually come up with four hybrid CD methods that are sufficiently decent without line search consideration and convert this globally via standard line search. That is via Riemannian standard wolf line criteria. Based on the numerical experimentation, which is based on 270 Riemannian test problems, which indicated that two of our proposed hybrid methods are efficient in comparison with other RCG methods with less number of iteration and gradient evolution, as well as CPU time. So thank you for listening. These are some of the basic uh, texts we consult in coming up with this presentation. These two, these first two texts are actually based on Euclidean CG parameters or structures while the other two are based on general Riemannian optimization concepts. Thank you. Any question or suggestion? Uh, Hello. Okay, it's a little. Yeah. Uh, Oh, okay, thank you very much for this uh, wonderful presentation. This is a uh, very interesting research, uh, even though the presentation is really lengthy. <laughs> so, but uh, I have some few points I would like to point out. Can I begin with the conclusion? Can I see the slide for the conclusion? Okay, uh, on the second part here, uh, you stated that uh, you are numerical result based on 270 Riemannian problems. Can we have a highlight of these 270 Riemannian problems? Are they really 270 different problems or they are just few problems uh, but uh, tested differently multiple times? Actually, when we look at the microphone. Hello, you're not open your microphone. Okay, I think, um, thank you for this uh, note. Actually, <laughs> We considered about uh, six problems, which we tested uh, differently based on changing the number of uh, some of uh, this in, in the problem. Like if we consider the problem one, whereby if we change this n to maybe say 50, we tested it 10 times, we changed it to maybe say 20, we tested, we tested it 10 times. So we continue doing that. So each one we tested there is considered as a given problem, whereby you have different uh, results there, but the graph is a cumulative graph of all the 270 problems tested differently. Actually, the numerical exper experiment is based on six problems which are tested differently with different dimensions and some other parameters as uh, regard the nature of the problem. Okay, that's okay. really that's have uh, you know, answered my curiosity. And uh, I would like you to take me to slide 35. Firstly, why, why do you choose to call this beta k 
beta k mu in bracket? Actually, because the sufficient distance actually rely on the value of u mu. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, what I'm seeing is um, first, can you go back? And okay. uh, at the same time, before then, the the original that is the classical CG parameter we are extending has mu from its definition. Oh, okay, which okay. is given by this here from the classical definition of the parameter beta k n mu. So when mu is uh, equal to zero and this condition holds, this parameter actually reduces to PRP method. Okay. If mu is equal to zero, while this condition does not hold, then this parameter will reduce to Flitter-Reeves method. So this, con this parameter now can be considered as a special hybrid of beta K, PRP, and flea tariffs based on the value of mu. Okay. And this very well. Uh, is it beta K for each K function depending on mu? Or one need to fix mu first, then you define beta K based on the fixed mu? Actually, in situation like this, mu is fixed. That is why you can see that in the sufficient descent, when we are proving the sufficient descent, we strictly say that uh, mu is greater than one. So okay. sometimes the excess of doing that is uh, for the numerical aspect, whereby you continue changing the value of mu in order to maybe have where the mu will be better. So based on that, you can have in this type of algorithm, it enables you to, to, to test the algorithm for a wide variety of values. Okay, okay. Um, so I have two comments based on what you just said. First of all, uh, we try to see if there is a way we can differentiate this representation with that of function. Usually we say a function, then put the input of that function in bracket like this, and then it gives a value. And then secondly, also, um, Thank you. Okay. Um, network in. I think it's network. Okay. We can hear you now. Uh, yes. yes. Quickly referring to uh, uh seventeen. Slide 17. Okay, I have seen definition of topology and host dog space. I'm thinking that uh, these are not necessary because most of the work that has been done in the literature are within the topological spaces. Even people work on metric space, it has to be topological space. People work linear settings also on that topological space. So these are the basic things that are not directly related to the contribution of your, your, your work. So I, I suggest that um, the definition of topology and also space should be mentioned. Okay. Rather, uh, one need to state clearly what differentiable manifold is. Because in your next slide, you mean the differentiable Manifold. manifold. I don't consider it to be necessary. And for a differentiable manifold, which is key in de in defining many manifold, we may consider you know putting it in place of topological manifold. Okay. So thank you very much. I think uh, my final comment is. On a well defined in slide 35.
side, slide 35. Is it 35? Yes. Okay, the middle one that is uh, highlighted with um, with red, I see. Um, Actually here, can you hear me? Yes. Here, if we look at this, we can actually apply the notion of sufficient descent here. Okay. Which is defined by this inequality, by this. Assuming this uh, okay. value is one, or we, is, we have, maybe this is rho. So we can now substitute this there so that we have positive there. Okay. So based on that, the we don't have problem with the definition of the beta key there. Oh yes, I see. Whenever mu is strictly bigger than one, yeah. but for mu becoming one, that is a serious problem yes. leading to something. So, so here I suggest a value of mu. That is to say, it must be strictly bigger than one. Yes. Um, distribution, as you mentioned in slide 40, is that uh, you relax the certain condition on the three point two. One, yes. Can you tell us more about these conditions you relaxed? Um, uh, Lima 3.21 in Rink and Weave paper, which is published in 2012. This paper actually is the first paper that extended equilibrium conjugate gradient method to Riemannian conjugate gradient method, whereby in showing the sufficient descent property of RFR, they use standard, that is they use, they use a weak wolf line search conditions. Okay. Based on what we have here, if we define our beta k with this structure, we can actually have the sufficient descent of FR without actually using line search. So this is where the relaxation comes in. Without using line search, yes, want... yes. Oh, that's really a great improvement. Yeah, yeah. thank you for the clarification. Thank that's you. all for me. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Anne Nasser, for this uh, wonderful presentation. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, actually, most of the comments I have, uh, I think my colleague have already taken care of uh, that part, especially the, I was so curious about the 270 test problems that I had. I think uh, it's good to be specific by saying that uh, there are two good, uh, six good uh, test problems that are considered in different dimensions, because whenever the dimension changes, the problems uh, the result, uh, we get a different result. So it is good to emphasize on that. And again, uh, the issue of this mu is also what I want to suggest to both of us. I use the mu just like the way it was used in the cl classical sense. And then uh, I received a comment uh, from the editor by saying that there is nothing tangible there because he's just seen almost something the same thing just like a direct extension. So I, I think since the mu is fixed, there is no need to put it together with the beta key. Mm -hmm. In all my other papers, I remove them. I just let it silence. What I introduced is mu, and this mu can change this. When mu is equal to so particular uh, value, it gives me this. If when it is give, equal to particular another value, it, it gives this. So by so doing, we are just maybe in, 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 in indirectly showing that we have done something very great, quite different from what uh, other uh, uh, authors did in the classical sense. I could recall the first paper in the classical sense by Wei et al, 2006. When you are proving the sufficient descent condition or the, con the convergence, you will notice that in the view, they are attaching one particular key, just like a sequences of this muse. 
So all these kind of things, I think they are, they are not needed. If we can just concentrate in trying to establish a convergence by giving it another form, not necessarily the way the classical sense did, by making it more simpler, I think it will be better. Yes. Uh, then um, again, uh, the uh, the other issue is the issue of topology. I think topology and Hosdorf, I think it's better to uh, maybe give an example or something. And then uh, the presentation took a very long uh, period of time, just like my own the other time. So I think it is better to, since we are going to, uh, maybe you, as, you, you will assume that some of the things in the classical sense are understood by many uh, audience, you can just go ahead and present what is necessarily in the, uh, in the Riemannian manifold. Thank you very much, Doctor. Okay, thank you for these comments. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the nice talk. Actually, there is nothing much to say, but uh, probably there is one or two things that might be useful. Um, can you go to the uh, theorem? Theorem? Where, where, yes, where you show the lower convergence and the right? Okay. This theorem? No, the next one. This one is like uh, the wolf, right? Okay. Is this one or the sufficient descent, uh, descent property theory? Yeah, I, I think this is the one I'm talking about. So can you go back to the previous one? Theorem two, I think. Actually, this is uh, <laughs> this is not supposed to be theorem two here. Okay. It's a mistake. I'm just uh, referring to this very theorem here. Okay. So mm -hmm. this technology. Uh, can you go to the uh, the experiment section? Okay. Where you reported the results. So uh, I'm still wondering because sometimes when the report is, you know, represented using this Dora uh, Amor performance profile, sometimes it's, it's a little bit difficult to be able to characterize which method is better than it. So I'm wondering, can you maybe expantiate between these hops, which one is better, which one is used, which one is not used, and so on? Okay. First of all, there are two important uh, parts as regards to the performance profile. The first one is uh, this part of the graph, which indicates the number of test portion a given method is able to solve, irrespective whether the method is the best or not. That's what this part actually says. While this part is actually saying that uh, a method that stay longer on this part actually solve uh, many problems to be the best. That's just the interpretations. So based on that, we can see that uh, we have two parts for the presentation of the graphs. In the first part, we can see that our two methods are able to beat other methods that we are comparing with, that is, the HRVLS one and two. While in the other part of the graph, we can easily see that our RCG one and two are also be the best because they stay longer on this part than the other methods. So based on this now, if you combine the two, we can now see that our proposed method are better than the other methods that we present based on this uh, figure one, that is uh, number of iteration A. 
but based on the number of iteration B, actually other methods are better than our own methods as far as uh, as for this as for solving uh many problems to be the base. Whereas our methods are able to solve many test problems that they are able to solve virtually all the test problem you considered. But the other methods that we are comparing with are unable to solve all the test problems. I think uh, in a nutshell, uh, actually there is a numerical table for this uh, presentation, but the table is so huge that you cannot uh, bring it here. That is why we, only, we normally, we only use the graphs in order to interpret the results. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yeah. So, kind of like a solution to talking about this kind of approach. Uh, as you may have mentioned, there are two things that you need to consider, maybe in order to be able to explain this kind of uh, approach. Uh, one is uh, the ability of your method to be able to solve your number of problems or having uh, at least so many problems and other. And the second one is uh, how efficient was it to be able to in terms of the order. So what you have by uh, the why at least uh, basically representing uh, uh, the kind of like success rate, or you can call it uh, uh, efficiency of a particular method or that order. Uh, while what you have as you just mentioned on the uh, on the right hand side is kind of talking about how robust that algorithm is in being able to solve uh, many problems. So maybe uh, you can consider looking at the maybe explain the terms or using this particular term efficiency and robustness uh, in order to be able to expand uh, what your method is and what other methods are in that regard. Uh, so in this case, basically we use two metrics, right? Performance based on II and II. Is it I? That is number of iteration, CPU time, and number of function evaluation. Okay, so so the, the A one is number of iteration. What about the second? This is for the, right? the gradient evaluation, while the last one is for the CPU time. If I understand, you have two, two different plots. You go A and B in each slide. Each of which is trying to talk yes. about the same. It worked actually prompted us to we differentiate the methods into two. In the first graph A, we consider classical. That is, uh, we consider the RFR, RPRP, and RLS methods together with our own methods. While in the second part of the plots, we consider some hybrid methods given by Sakai and Iduka, that of tank and uh, with our own hybrids. So we differentiated the, the, the experiment into two groups, whereby the first group is what, with some uh, uh, I say classical Riemannian CD methods, while the second groups are with hybrid methods. And please, can we go back to the conclusion? Conclusion? Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you for these comments. Okay, uh, with no question, thank you for the nice question. Uh, and today we finish. Everyone,